in uh, all right let me uh, say something that i've been saying for a long time and which is probably very somewhat controversial um my sense is that the collapse of the soviet union is a real historical fact which has had enormous consequences and one of the consequences is that a lot of people on the left genuinely don't know how to go from here um and here again i'm talking of a broad left not social democrats but other than that i have believed that in this period there is going to be an enormous amount of experimentation now you see in india this is not very easy to comprehend about other countries because in india the left movement has been historically associated with the communist movement and that's that you can sort of fight over what over that cpi cpi and cpi ml and so on but there is a but that's the field within which you have you have it uh, trotskism anarchism no forces in india you know there are about 3 trotskists in this country so far right maybe 5 uh, <clears throat> in europe these have been real forces certainly communists but these have been real forces the the second again that that very broad conceptual level my sense is that the retreat of defeat whatever you call it of of communism and the total assimilation of social democracy into the agenda of finance has meant that the third major left force of the 19th century which is anarchism will necessarily rise to contest for that space in some countries such as spain for example anarchism has been a very large force and so on now okay. given these sort of views that i have on a broad conceptual level one is that i do consider that these are left forces genuinely they are not social democrats sriza could have formed the government but sipra simply said that thing is null and void um that um <clears throat> pact that is being imposed on greece and the he, i th- i think he is doing the right thing and the, the the greek communist party is doing the wrong thing i agree with uh, with pravat on that he is not saying i'll come out of the eurozone but what he is saying the logic of it is that greece probably will but the onus would be on finance capital okay. of throwing them out okay uh <clears throat> that is the right right attitude for them in my view um revisionist uh, you know uh, it probably made sense in 1950s or earlier points in history but at this point in greece uh what does it mean uh sriza himself came from the communist party of the uh <coughs> exterior actually um and um and a lot of his people have actually come out of the communist movement um they they are experimenting with forms they are saying it's a very interesting political form that their so party or whatever you want to call it has he has a party there are six others in sriza they all have their platforms when the party congress comes you are 
allowed fully to put up your platform, your candidates, etc., etc. Open conflicts. But once the vote has been taken and a party policy has been established, everyone has to. In other words, a sort of a notion that even in a party, there always are different views and it is better to allow these views to be organized as factions within the party so long as the issue of party majority um, decision is upheld. So it's a very, now some in of them are Greens. A, in a sense it's a kind of a, uh, it's a, it's a rework version if you will of the early Soviet um, pre-1920, I mean, before the factions were actually planned, uh, the yeah. Bolshevik party. Yeah, or, also or, the, or the first, or the first working men's association right. Right. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the time of Marx. Right. They were Marxists and they were anarchists and they were, uh, and among anarchists, they were Proudhonists and they were Baculinists and this and that and so on. And they were all in the same association and so on. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, the, these my sense is that these experiments will go on. And given the blockage of the left, it's a good thing. Sometimes errors will be made, sometimes opportunism will be there and so on. But the principle here is actually very similar to what Prabhat is saying. The broadest possible unity of the left. You know, um, Sriza wants the Communist Party to come into the government and this will again uh, come up uh, if uh, as it is expected next month if Sriza does gain, does emerge as the largest party you know this time they got about 17% polls are saying they'll get 27% if they get 27% this time they had 52 seats, 27% uh, probably means 70, 75, 80 seats, in which case they also get those 50 seats and so on. So they go, they, they have 120, 130 seats there. So the idea of a left majority becomes credible. And at that time, the Communist Party will have to make up its mind. Is it going to prevent the formation of such a government or not? Sriza's thing is to, jo to bring together all the left forces against this finance capital. Yes. Yes, I think third period politics at this moment would really be pretty disastrous because you're right that the extreme right is gaining on a national platform. I think to the extent the left develops well and good. But if the left fails the people, then there will be a swing to the right and we may actually end up having fascist governments in many of these countries. Uh, yeah. in, in Greece, there is a real possibility. For the first time, the fascist party, and they are real fascists, unlike Marine Le Pen. Marine Le Pen, I don't think, is really a fascist. She's extreme right wing radical. No, but those are fascists. Um, they have entered parliament for the first time in Greece. And the vote of the extreme right is about 20%. Right. Uh, so it is the highest that the extreme right has ever got in this. Let's just get back uh, to the question of the left. Uh, do you think that in, in, in this moment of this kind of experimentation that's happening, uh, not just in terms of formal parties, but also uh, uh, social movements, occupy movements, etc., etc. Now, is there a sense that you get that this may be in fact uh, presaging a sort of a European spring, if you will, uh, in the way that, for instance, in the 90s and the 2000s, there was what got called variously as the pink tide and so on in, uh, in South America, Latin America. Do you see something like that? maybe emerging in, in Europe. 
I see a world spring. Why only Europe? <laughs> I mean, I th think of the Occupy movement. I mean, Chomsky has said this is the most exciting thing he has seen in his lifetime in more recent, you know, okay, uh, since the defeat of fascism or something. You know, because I think uh, it's remarkable because after all, it's actually a demand for equality. It is actually saying the 99% versus the 1%. And in, in that sense, bringing back the issue of class. Absolutely. And what is more, the next step in it is likely to be Occupy factories. Right. And, you know, so, so, so the point is that it's really a, a very dynamic thing. I think everywhere in the world, there are all kinds of innovations going on. And I don't think only in Europe, everywhere. And I think that's, that's really quite remarkable. What is your sense of this? Uh, two or three. Mary Le Pen's. Marine Le Pen's. I'm, I'm, as you can see, very fascinated by this phenomenon. Marine Le Pen's, um, one of her many slogans was, bring on the French spring. Okay. So, um, she uses that language very happily. My second point is that, and this I have actually written in one of my articles in Frontline, that the so-called Arab Spring or Arab uprisings, as I would prefer to call them, but they themselves, I think, an extension or the broadening of the great militancy, working class militancy that occurred in Europe, um, across, across Southern Europe, immense, in, uh, including France, immense. France. And Tunisia is very close, physically very close. And in every way is very close to Europe. And that working class militancy uh, in uh, Europe had a, has, I think, a very considerable impact um, in, in the Arab Spring. So it's a kind of a movable feast, so to speak. You know. um, now, you said about Latin America. About that, what I want to sort of bring up is then on the one hand, um, what the Greeks have very much on their minds, I think, is the experience of Argentina and Ecuador. That you can repudiate the debt and survive. Uh, you can tell the IMF to pack up and survive. And in fact, Argentina became very prosperous after that. And that prosperity continues. Uh, so Greeks are actually, I think, uh, quite uh, aware of the fact. And I think that if that Argentine and Ecuador experiences weren't there, uh, the Greeks might, might have been, the Greek left, might have been a little more at sea as to what to do. Which, of course, I think in my own view means that if they're serious about it, they'll have to nationalize the banks. The <clears throat> And so on. they'll have to have a very different kind. The problem is that in Latin America, it was a continental wave. In Europe, and all is said and done, Greece is alone. Movements in other countries are not nearly as mature. There is no crisis point. The crisis point has come in the country which is very small, etc., etc. You know, so um, where will the sustenance for Greece come? Um, within the continent? I don't know. Um, I don't expect Mr. Holland to stand with the Greeks at all. This is my view. He's a machine politician of a certain sort. Um, <coughs> My sense is that there may be a logic unfolding in Greece where the ruling class really has no option but a coup d'etat. Um, I don't think the NATO countries are going to allow a revolution in a European country. And Syriza either surrenders the whole thing, or actually makes a revolution of some kind. Um, what that will mean, I don't know. The generation that suffered, 
under a coup d'etat in Greece is still alive. So I don't know. But the extreme right has power to hit back on an isolated country in Greece in a way in which their options in Latin America were limited. Well, um, I'm afraid we, we will have to uh, wind up uh, this session now. I wouldn't even try to sort of summarize or you know, uh, make some uh, final remarks or anything of the kind. Uh, I would just say that uh, the, it's very clear listening to both uh, Professor Ilyas Ahmed and Professor Prabhat Patnaik that, that on the one hand we are living through exciting times. On the other hand, it's also true that the only way that one can make sense of these exciting times and to, uh, and to grapple with these exciting times, one is to engage in the very hard task of, uh, in a sense, re-educating oneself, re-reading, making oneself literate all over again uh, in Marxist theory and, and praxis. And uh, this little uh, space that we have here, uh, uh, the May Day bookstore uh, and cafe, uh, hopes to uh, actually become a space where these kind of sessions uh, will, <coughs> will inspire us uh, and will motivate us to, to keep going back to uh, some of our long-held uh, held beliefs and to, and to re-examine uh, our theory and our praxis uh, again and again. Uh, so well, thanks very much. Uh, to both uh, our distinguished and eminent speakers. Thanks very much to all of you. Uh,